thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers of this YAPSI EU. have been having a blast so far. And my wife and I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're constantly moving from country to country, looking for the next country to leave. And she loves Spain, and now I know why. Wow, Granada's beautiful. So if you haven't had a chance to get out and see it, I highly, highly urge you to. It's just magnificent. So uh, company all around the world, we do uh, bespoke training, uh, bespoke software development, uh, all sorts of things that folks need, customized specifically for what you need. So if you need anything related to Perl, databases, whatever, agile training, just come talk to me, give me my card, see what we can do for you. And that's enough of the pitch. So turning points, YAPSI EU 2015, what are turning points? A point where a decisive change takes place, a critical point, crisis. You can choose any definition you want for the various turning points I'm going to talk about in this talk. But when I was at FOSDEM in Brussels uh, a few months ago, I was asked, you know, would I like to be the keynote speaker here? And I said, yes. I'm very honored whenever I'm given an opportunity to do this. It's a lot of fun. I love seeing you folks again. I move often enough that I know many of you better than my neighbors. <clears throat> and because keynotes are different, for a keynote, there's a wider audience. I need to be broader. I can't just talk about logging in Perl or something like that. I need to try and encompass everything. So for a keynote, I ask, you know, what's the theme of the conference? They told me art and engineering. Art. Art. What do I know about art? So uh, <clears throat> this could be the shortest keynote in Perl history. I realized I was in trouble. I don't know anything about painting. I don't know anything about sculpture. Stephen Little's going to be giving a talk about art. He's got an art background. I asked Stephen Little about it. I remember nothing about that conversation. Alcohol was involved. Yes. Um, so, and I started thinking about this, and I'm worried. And I, I really struggled with this keynote. It was hard. What do I know about art? I know not, uh, uh, Wait. Art can be the written word. A lot of people know me online as Ovid, and I happen to know a thing or two about poetry. <laughs> so I, I, I'm actually not an English major. I went to university to be an economist, came out a programmer, happens all the time. But I, I do know a little bit about poetry. Don't quote me on any of this. Don't record me. Oh, too late. Ovid was fascinating. So he's, uh, he's from the age of classic literature, uh, 2,000 years ago, around the time of Christ. Very interesting reading about him. Uh, he wrote a lot of interesting things. Uh, he wrote The Metamorphosis. Pyramus and Thisbe, two of the characters in the Metamorphosis, a huge series of tales. Uh, you probably know of them as Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare also used them again in a, a mini play within A Midsummer's Night's Dream. Uh, he still influences writers today. He's magnificent, the stuff he has. And it's fascinating, 2,000 years ago, he wrote an anti-abortion poem. And it wasn't based upon morality, it was practicality. What if we accidentally kill the next Caesar? He wrote an uh, interesting poem. Uh, on facial treatment for ladies, about makeup. I think this is the first recorded history of a mansplaining. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but what really grabbed me, what really turned me on to poetry, a turning point for me in my appreciation of literature was uh, Elegy 9B, translation by a guy named Peter Green. No, I don't mean the guitarist and founder, founder of Fleetwood <coughs> Mac. I mean a very famous historian in that era. And the opening lines of Elegy 9B were, if I heard a voice from heaven say, live without loving, I'd beg off. Girls are such exquisite hell. And at that time in my life, that really said something to me. And it was just moving. But you know, he's an older poet. Most people don't know about him today. Alfred Lord Tennyson is known a little bit better. He was a poet laureate of Great Britain and Ireland. And he was a Victorian poet. And Victorian poetry, it was very highly structured. This was a time of the birth and the flowering of the sciences. And they talked a lot about man conquering nature. And they used very careful, precise, educated language. And there's some controversy in some people's circles about how great a poet he was. And he's very hit or miss for me. But his poem, Lady Clara Vere de Vere, to me, was fascinating. It was wonderful. And it was about class struggle. A fictional noblewoman named Lady Clara Vere de Vere would tell men, get the commoners to fall in love with her, and then she would discard them. It was her little game, until one of them committed suicide. And in this poem, Tennyson wrote, Lady Clara Vere de Vere, I know you're proud to bear your name. Your pride will bear no make, your, ah, your pride is, I know this thing like the back of my hand, and here I am standing up, looking like an idiot. Lady Clara Vere de Vere, I know you're proud to bear your name. Your pride is yet no mate for mine, to, too proud to care from whence I came, nor would I break for your sweet sake a heart that dotes on truer charms. 
A simple maiden in her flowers worth a hundred coats of arms. There was power in that. There was rage in that. And it was very popular at the time because of the dis distinction of class struggle, talking about the noble people versus the commoners. But the language was very elevated, very precise. That was a hallmark of Victorian poetry. Now, what most people don't know is my favorite poet is actually John Davidson. He was a 19th century Scottish poet. And in the classic style of many poets, he committed suicide later, very, very sad thing. And he's considered the first of the moderns. Modern poetry relies less on structure in some cases of Victorian poetry. <clears throat> Instead of man conquering nature, it's more man working with nature. And it tended to use the common everyday language instead of very careful, educated language. And in one of the most magnificent poems ever written, 30 Bob a Week, he also talks about class struggle. And in this, 20 Bob makes a pound in old style British currency. 30 Bob a Week was effectively minimum wage. The narrator of this poem was talking about being a clerk, living on minimum wage, and his wife and his children and their struggles and the rage against the difficulties they have. And in one magnificent verse, he's talking about the stoicism of his wife, how she handles it. But you never hear her do a growl of wine, for she's made of flint and roses. Very odd. And I have to cut my meaning rather fine, or I'd blubber, for I'm made of greens and sod. So perhaps we are in hell for all that I can tell, and lost and damned and served up hot to God. I love that. It's incredible. So much of his work to me is very moving. And you'll notice the language is a lot coarser. It's a lot closer to modern day language, although that was 19th century slang. But poetry doesn't stop there. This is modern poetry. We have postmodern poetry. <laughs> yes, yes, this famous American poet, Larry Wall. You may have heard of his poem, Black Pearl, and that great line, everyone must participate in forbidden standard of conduct violations. <clears throat> so as some of you may have noticed, I have just transitioned from art to engineering. And yes, that was a train wreck of a transition. <laughs> because, by oh golly, I, I don't know much about art. But I do know a little bit about postmodern Pearl. Actually, I don't still know what postmodern quite means in this context. But I do know something about Pearl and Pearl history. And Pearl history has a lot of interesting turning points in it. We have Pearl 1, 1987, Pearl 2, 1988, Pearl 3, 1989, two years later is Pearl 4, with a little asterisk after that, which I'll get to in a moment, Pearl 5, 1994, and then things get a little bit wobbly. <clears throat> 1991 was a major turning point for Pearl. The Pink Camel, version four of Pearl, published by O'Reilly and Associates. So several interesting things about this. So, <clears throat> From my reading about this, uh, the reason it's called Pearl 4 is because they needed a version number for the book. Version numbers can sometimes be political. Linus did that for the uh, Linux kernel at one point, for example. Version numbers aren't that important, but most people don't know that. Also, O'Reilly and Associates, this was a big turning point for them because they were founded in 1978. They were actually a consulting firm writing tech, doing a lot of technical writing. It wasn't until the 1980s they started publishing their popular nutshell books, and it was in the early 1990s when they started focusing on a lot of non-commercial technologies and were transforming into a publishing company. So, founded in 1978, that was kind of the birth of the modern computing era, big turning point back then, and this was a beautiful symbiotic relationship between Pearl and O'Reilly, helping to propel both of them forward. Mosaic 1.0 was released in 1993, and the the web was conceived before this, but this was the birth of the web, if you will, because this was the first browser which had inline images. You didn't click and get another window or something like that with the image that you were looking for. So the modern web kind of started in 93, but it was 97 when we had the dot-com explosion. Now, just out of curiosity, I was living in the United States back then. Is there anyone here who was in the industry and living in the United States during the dot first dot-com explosion? So a couple of you will be familiar with, yeah, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> so a couple of you will be familiar with what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, it may have been the same over here in Europe. I wasn't living here then, I don't know. The technical standards at the time were very fascinating. For example, I was in Alaska doing some work with the Department of Education. The Alaskan Congress, a bunch of politicians who oddly enough knew nothing about education, decided to fix the Alaskan education system and the financial problems it had, and by accident, pretty much gutted it. 
Um, it's a long story, which I can tell you later over a beer. I don't have the time now. It's, it's hilarious and sad at the same time because all the students are suffering. And now they're trying to recover. And part of what I was doing was helping them build lesson plans online so a teacher, instead of spending days or weeks building up a lesson plan and figuring out which Alaskan state standards it met, could simply download one. And it didn't work when I was giving a demo, which was very embarrassing. And I checked the HTML. There was a form tag missing. So I popped open the HTML in Notepad. And one of the Alaskan techies looked over my shoulder while I'm hacking on HTML. He said, what are you doing? Uh, the HTML's broken. I'm fixing it. What he said then was not a joke. There was no trace of irony. This was the technical standards back then. He turned to another Alaskan techie and said, real programmers write web pages in Notepad. <laughs> It was a different era. This was an era when, if you had the letters H, T, M, and L, not necessarily in that order, on your CV, you had a job, and it paid well. Many companies knew that they had to have web pages, so they didn't know how to write them, so they would tell their clerk, can you learn this HTML thing and you know, give us web pages? And the clerks would do it, and six months later, they realized they're now a senior web developer, and they quit, and they get a job for twice the money. Lots of people were flooding into the system, getting well-paying jobs. Lots of people who knew nothing about programming, who knew nothing about our background, about how to build systems. But having a bunch of static web pages, it's really hard to curate them. It's very expensive. It might be okay for, say, the physics community or something back then where they're sharing you know, less knowledge than they do now, but it's expensive, and you need to update it for business. SSI, server side includes, that was one way of doing it. Technically, they can be Turing complete, but in reality, they're a pain. <coughs> Yeah, JavaScript. It took, first, I think it was called MochaScript, and then LiveScript, now JavaScript, or maybe ECMAScript being the standard, or JavaScript being the name. Who the heck knows at this point? But back then, it wasn't very portable. <clears throat> CGI changed a lot. CGI was really exploding in 1997, the beginning of the dot-com boom. Huge turning point. And for the next three years, it was incredible. But there was a double-edged sword. By the way, thank you for foreshadowing this, Dave. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, in case you're wondering, this is a screenshot from a couple of days ago. It is still on the web. <laughs> and Dave with one of Perlmongers led a project called NMS to try and create drop-in replacements for these. MathScript Archive was kind of a double-edged sword because you had a lot of people who didn't know anything about programming, who knew a little bit about HTML. We're now learning a little bit about Perl, downloading these scripts and adding functionalities that are site and bringing in value. And it looked really great and exciting. And we know about security holes. We know about how unmaintainable these things were, and it was difficult to build systems on top of them. And now we're starting to get a problem, because now a few years into the dot-com explosion, we're starting to look bad. We had a flood of inexperienced people come in who didn't know how to program, who were programming in a language which you probably want to have a little bit more skill to deal with. You had people who didn't know anything about security opening up a whole bunch of security holes. It's not that the language was insecure. It's that these people didn't know anything about security. But people outside this said, Pearl's right only, it's insecure by default. Things actually, they were, things were turning down for Pearl at this point. They were, we were gonna have some hassle, and then another huge turning point, July 18th, 2000, broken mug thrown at the wall, not that one. And <clears throat> a couple of days later, the Pearl 6 project was announced. And then after that, we had what I call the angst of the aughts. This was a troublesome time for us. This was a difficult time for us. So I've looked at this many different ways, and everything I've seen is pretty much the same trend. Pearl is falling. We've leveled out. But that was a very, very difficult time for the Pearl community. That last turning point didn't go well. And I love Pearl 6. If I could drop Pearl 5 tomorrow and only do Pearl 6, I absolutely would. But there were issues at the time. One of the things I often heard at this time was, you know, Pearl is dead. You know, Pearl programmers don't know what they're doing. It's a write-only language. And why should we start in Pearl 5? Because Pearl 6 is going to make it obsolete. It was a tough time. It was one of the darkest times for the Pearl community and what we were going through. It was very frustrating for us. So part of that was the Pearl is dead thing. That was interesting. That was showing up a lot in 2005, 2006, according to my research. I did a lot for this talk to find out exactly what was going on. And Pearl jobs started dropping at this point. Pearl developers were leaving at this point. It was hard. No, this is not a feel-good talk. It was a difficult thing that we had to deal with. And Pearl release history stagnated right about the same time, but there were reasons for that. 2020 hindsight is all well and good, but we understood what was going on at the time, and many people were very happy about the process. But nonetheless, to the outsider, it looked like Pearl had stagnated. And this, coupled with the blogs, wasn't very fun. So why do you read tech blogs? 
opinion, advice, learning a new technique. But Billy Joe Jim Bob's VB script blog saying Perl is dead, is that well researched? No, it's not. Why? Because a lot of times they don't understand what's going on. Much of what was happening with the drop in Perl was simply a very powerful market, lots of money to be made. So of course competition is going to come in there and our market share is going to drop. It was difficult for us. This was, to me, the low point of the Perl community. But these opinions on these blogs have one problem. They're not research. Imagine, for example, you're the CTO of a major company and you've got a major uh, initiative that you want to launch and you're trying to figure out which technologies you're going to back it with. Are you going to go out to Billy Joe Jim Bob's VB script blog? No. This would be silly. Not if you want to keep your job, not if you want to keep the jobs of all the people underneath you. You need research. Research is actually kind of hard to come by, but there, is, there are some sources available. And one interesting source is a group called Gardner. So fair warning, I might call on you if you hold your hand up, but show of hands, how many people actually know what Gardner is? Okay, more people than I thought, which is great because they're very interesting. Gartner, formerly known as the Gartner Group, they were founded in 1979, again, the birth of modern computing. Uh, IT technology, research and advisory firm, they're typically not targeting us, most of us in this room. Some of us in this room they are, but who are they targeting? They're targeting CTOs, CIOs, senior industry people with research. And I happen to get my grubby little hands on their 2013 programming language report. These cost about $2,000 a piece, by the way. So most of us don't just shell out the money out of our pocket to read the things. It was only covering major languages. And what Gardner does is they talk about the current state of the industry, and then they project out to the near future. So sometimes they get things wrong, because when you predict the future, you get things wrong sometimes. So I was reading this 2013 report. They're talking about major languages. So Perl's in there. And oh, I didn't actually show you that slide. I should have. Perl's in there. What did Gardner say about Perl 2013 in their research? Pearl will remain a solid technology investment for the near future. That is what their very careful research led them to believe. Now, Gartner is interesting. They actually work very hard for this. And this is one of the premier groups who talk about information like this. And what else did they say about Pearl? Well, it's interesting because they actually described Pearl very fairly in that report. It was very good. They cited the community as a strength. And they did talk about the fact that the falling market share was due to competition which is perfectly understandable. So it was a very good report. There were, there were some ups, there were some downs, but it was a very good positive report and something nice. But I found it very interesting when they talked about citing the community as a strength in 2013. What happened? In 2005, I'm not sure that we would have cited the community as a strength. There was a lot of bickering. There was a lot of arguing. There was a lot of difficulties. But in the interim, we realized this. And we pulled together. We started tar talking about you know, better communications. We started releasing better tools. We started to knit together as a community. And we worked very, very hard to get past many of those problems. And as Matt Trout pointed out in one keynote in a line I absolutely love, he said, as a community, we leveled up. We are actually in a fantastic position now because we finally stabilized. We've got a strong, robust community. We have a con continually evolving language really great backwards compatibility where if you're a corporation and you're concerned, you know that your language, your tools are still going to run on newer versions of Perl. We've got a rich ecosystem. CPAN testers is phenomenal. If you want to be releasing all sorts of tools and make sure they run on a variety of different operating systems, different versions of those operating systems, different versions of a language, for an enterprise client that could cost millions of dollars, we give it to you for free. It's amazing. And no matter what they threw at us, no matter how hard they hit us, we're still here and we're still standing. In fact, the way I like to think about it is we're battle tested. We are strong. We're not a JavaScript framework of the week. <laughs> You're not going to be adopting us and saying, oh, crud that they forked. Now what are we going to do? We're not Zool, VRML, DHTML, or anything like that. In fact, for one client, I released a Zool front end to my code, and a couple years later, I realized it was obsolete. I felt very bad about that. And from an ethical standpoint, I said, I can't do that to a client again. I didn't realize what I was doing. I thought it was really cool, but I jumped the gun too soon, and I learned my lesson, and I felt very bad about that. But think about this. You've got a new startup, and you 
are focused on a business problem and you've got to choose some technology to back it. You really want to bet that startup and the jobs of a lot of people on a new technology you don't control? No. We're battle tested. We have the world's best testing infrastructure for open source, hands down. So there's some other communities doing some great things for testing, you know, things on modules, you know, BDD, a whole bunch of other things which are really fantastic. But overall, CPAN testers, we are number one. We're one of the fastest dynamic languages. We've got the best Unicode support, a bit clunky at times. Those abstractions are leaking, but it's really, really good. <clears throat> CPAN's very relevant, and we finally have a strong, healthy community, which is great to see. But communication's hard. Really hard, and a lot of people outside the Perl community, they're not seeing this right now. We've done a great job of healing and talking inside the Perl community. Outside the Perl community, no one knows what's going on. And why is communication hard? Well, I want to talk about headlines for a little bit. So these are just a smattering of various headlines that I picked up because they're a really important means of communication. How many of you have gotten in an argument with someone about some news piece to discover they've only read the headline? Yeah. Very, very common problem. So all of these headlines, bar one, are wrong for various reasons. News organizations trying to make some money are rushing out there as fast as they can to get the news out there. And so let's take a look at some of these headlines. So this one, take it to the bank, Senator Elizabeth Warren wants to raise minimum wage to $22 an hour. Uh, technically, that's what's known as a lie. If you read the article, you would have found out she said if minimum wage kept pace with productivity since 1960, then it would have been $22 an hour. However, she advocates a $10.10 minimum wage raise. The source of this, WashingtonTimes.com, this is still online, by the way, WashingtonTimes.com, they were owned by the Unification Church, now they're owned exclusively, I believe, by Reverend Sung Young Moon. They are known as the newspaper for up-and-coming conservatives in Washington to read. They have an agenda. This was a hit piece designed to make her look like a left-wing nut job. She may be, she may not, but that's still a lie. There's no question about it. Sometimes we have things, uh, just, you know, pure propaganda. Obama calls Libyan president to thank him after U.S. ambassador murdered. <laughs> now, I particularly like this uh, thing on the side. Fox News Go, 24 hours of fair and balanced news coverage. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, just to be clear, and my apologies, even the conservatives in this room, the hardcore conservatives, are going to say, wait, wait, what's going on there? Because you have to be extremely ideologically driven or very dense to not say, wait, what's going on with that headline? And it turns out, after the U.S. ambassador was murdered in Libya, the president had expressed his condolences and set up a 50-person task force to find out who was responsible, and Obama thanked him for his support, which is what heads of states do. But technically, yes, he did call him after the U.S. ambassador was murdered. So headlines, very fascinating. Yes, this is still online. Sometimes headlines are written by idiots. 17 remain dead in morgue shooting spree. <laughs> Sometimes headlines are incomplete, though. This one was very disturbing to me. Uh, basically, the headline says, digital mammography does not work. Now, imagine uh, you're a young woman in the United States, 30 years old, and you have a family history of breast cancer. Your physician says, well, we can get you a digital mammogram, but they're very expensive. Your insurance doesn't cover it. Do you want to get it? So you've got to pay for it out of your pocket. You've got a family history. There's a life or death decision. But you've read this, so you know it doesn't work. What you did not read in the headline, and in fact, it is buried five, uh, five paragraphs into the story, is that this was a single study done on women 66 years old and older. It doesn't apply to 30-year-old women, and it was only a single study. So this is actually modernhealthcare.com. They're a very serious news site. They weren't trying to be dishonest. They weren't trying to be misleading. But there's only so much information you can pack into a headline. So why don't people read articles? Well, if you don't care about a topic, if you don't understand a topic, or if your personal biases are triggered, you might just take a headline at face value. This is how hard communication can be. So if you actually take the time to read the article, there's too much information, too little time, so we tend to skim. And something called the inverted pyramid ties into that. So if you're in journalism at all, you know what this is. Most important information goes in the first paragraph, second most important information goes in the second paragraph, and so on. And in the days of print media, this is very useful. If you had four column inches left 
and there was an eight column inches in the article, you could cut it off a couple of paragraphs in and fit it and still have the major points in the story. It turns out this also works very well for the, well for the web because what happens, people read the first paragraph and they skim for important stuff afterwards generally. Information is hard. It is really hard to get across. So we have another turning point coming up. This is a big one. This is a wonderful one, one I'm very happy about. The headline's going to be interesting, though. What? So Perl 6 is released. What do you think is going to happen on that headline? A lot of people are going to say, OK, fine, Perl 5 is finally dead. <laughs> you, of all people. That was Nick Clark, by the way. So I, I'm very happy with Perl 5. I love Perl 6. But the reality is, uh, that's, that's a lot of what's going to happen. It's going to pull into a lot of people's personal biases. But I don't think it's going to hurt Perl 5 that much. Those people who know what's going on, you know, that core market is already stable. We already know what's happening. It's not going to hurt Perl 5 too much. But people are going to start asking questions. This could start pulling in more interest in Perl, and people are going to ask. You know, they're not necessarily going to know what a sister language is, but we can educate them on that. And so they're going to start checking out, possibly, what's going on with Perl. So what are they going to do? Perl.com. Last article almost two years ago. We had an ar average of two articles a year. Back in 2000, it was over an article a week. Perl.com is dead. In fact, this advertisement on the side, Tom Christensen Perl Training, that's a dead link. So this is not good. Perl monks. <laughs> yeah, OK, that, that's enough of Perl monks. So some of you might remember usePerl.org, which was replaced by blogsperl.org, which looks much prettier, but which one could you reliably post a comment to? <laughs> now, to be fair, Dave Cross and Aaron Crane have had the thankless job of putting out fires with this thing from day one. And they had a very painful code base, MT, which was very frustrating. And they've done an admirable job of keeping up. But this one we actually have some good news on, because there's a Perl Foundation grant, which uh, Jeff, Groff, Jeff Goff has accepted to replace this with Perl B, which Evozone is supporting. They're actually going to have a graphic designer. And they're doing work to import the database so we don't lose the old articles, but we'll have a modern, shiny, clean CMS for blogs, Perl.org. So that's one success story we're going to have out of this. The one question is, for once, we can seriously ask the question, will it be ready before Perl 6? So how do we fix this? How do we actually get ahead of the game? Because we now have a chance. Because we know this turning point's going to happen, what can we do? First of all, we need to stop bickering about Perl 5, Perl 6. If you don't like what's going on, okay, that's fine. If you want to shovel back the ocean with a fork, please stand over there, because it's not going to do any good. And I'm sorry, I know some of you really like to bicker about that. It doesn't help us. We need to focus a lot better on communication and on getting this information outside the bubble. And why do I say battle tested? I like this as a tagline for Perl. I mean, Python, when they call it executable pseudocode, what Python is saying for their tagline is basically, we're easy, we're simple, there's one way to do it. That's a very powerful message for Python. Ruby has the Perl done right, which depending on your biases might not be the best marketing strategy. <laughs> Perl, Perl 5's tagline could be battle tested because we are, it is true, and we are not going away. And we need to get ahead of the message. First of all, we need to fix the Perl.com problem. Do we make it go away? Do we redirect it? Do we actually manage to get articles out there? I don't know what we're going to do about that. I've been talking to uh, Karen Polly, president of the Perl Foundation, Yakov, also with the Perl Foundation, and we've been discussing various things. Uh, we'll call this Chatham Health Rules. I'm not going to say who came up with which idea, partially because I can't remember. Um, so <clears throat> we need to fix the Perl.com problem. We need to start getting news articles written. We need to start getting them out there, get them out there on something like PR Newswire. So a lot of firms, a lot of uh, a lot of media sources are desperate for articles, and they will pick up what we send out to them, and they will republish it. And we can get our face out there again in front of the community. Some of you may have remembered recently, a trans woman was very nervous about going to a conference, but she came to a pro conference, and we welcomed her with open arms. And this became a big, wonderful news story. <laughs> That's because we leveled up. We're a mature community. And I was very, very proud to see that. And that was a good positive message to get out about Pearl. And we could do more of that. 
I'd like to see us get journalists at Yapsi. Sponsor a journalist, get them a hotel room, pay for their flight, you know, get them out there, get them drunk, you know, get a minder out there who actually knows the Pearl community, who can introduce them to various people so they can see how vibrant we are. They can see how much we're actually doing, and they can see that we are, in fact, battle tested. They do that at Asia. They do that at Yapsi Asia? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I... <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. For those of you who didn't hear that, he said they've been doing that at Yapsi Asia for the last 10 years. So Pearl's doing well in Asia, from what I've been hearing. We can do better with this here. We can do better with communicating about this. Also, the name Yapsi, it's a lovely joke, but to many people, it is a joke. I'm sorry. Outside the community, a couple of people are talking about Yapsi. They have no idea what you're talking about. O'Reilly gave us back Pearl.com. I'm willing to bet if we talk to them, they'll give us back the Pearl Conference because OSCON is no longer a language conference. It's a technology conference. And we ask them, we can get this back. And we can become the Pearl Conference again. People will hear, instead of YAPC, they'll hear the Pearl Conference. And I know this is going to hurt for some folks, but the Pearl Conference is a better name for what we do. And it is going to help. There's other stuff we can do. We could start subscribing to PR Newswire. That could be extremely expensive. Um, the variety of things that we've talked about. But part of what will be needed here is we're going to need some volunteers. Depending upon how soon Pearl 6 comes out, we could need them very quickly. And if any of you are interested in participating and helping with this, Mark Keating, Mark, where are you? Okay. Ah. Yes, he runs the marketing committee. We should call it a communications group because people who don't know what marketing is get really scared by the name. Mark runs the marketing committee for the Pearl Foundation. You can talk to him. And that can help with this. Myself, you can talk to me if you are concerned about you know, how you can participate. And we can find a way of getting this out there. Some of this, is, some of this could cost money. If you're a company who relies on Pearl and would like to get the word out there, would like to get more Pearl developers out there, would like to start breathing it in, because we're really at a great space. We're really in a great position, a solid foundation for the Pearl community then you can help us out with this. You can come talk to me, Mark, and others, and we can figure out a way to put this together because there's a lot of opportunities now, and now is the perfect time to get this done because we're battle-tested and we're ready. Pearl 6 is coming. It is time to let people know what the difference is. It is time to get outside of our bubble, and it is time to help because we have healed ourselves, and it's awesome. And I want to thank you very much for listening to me. plenty of time. <laughs> so I worked on this repeatedly over and over and I was coming in at 50, 55 minutes every time and I don't know how I managed to come up here and cut so much time. Ordinarily we don't take questions and keynotes. People come up, they talk, they go down, but you've seen a number of times my keynotes. I do do that. So does anyone have any questions? Christina? You're welcome. Yes, she's darling. The PHP community. I missed out on PHP community. Is that what you're asking? Uh, I. I was trying not to make this a language slugfest. I was trying not to tear down, say, you know, Python or Ruby or anything like that, some of the major competitors that we have. Uh, there's a lot I can say about other languages, and the reality is for many people, you know, the strength of a language is based upon their personal perception of it. We can say great things about Ruby, Python, many other tools, uh, but it, a lot of it comes down to personal preference, and I didn't want to get into, you know, too much dealing with other languages and trying to go down that path. So I deliberately, you know, cut off a lot of that. I was going to say, Brian, oh, that narrows it down.
that is something we sit down and chat quite a bit about. Um, you know, yeah, there's a very shallow learning curve for PHP and quite a number of things until you have to remember all the different invocations of different things or find out which insecure function of this, you know, database tool that you happen to be using. Um, PHP, you know, even the creator of PHP admits that it's an extremely inconsistent language, but there are a lot of resources out there. And one of the problems with communication, it makes it very hard to evaluate a given resource at any given time. So if you just happen to hit some random blog, which is giving you advice, uh, you know, I still hit blogs today, which are saying foreign keys in the database are a bad idea. Um, MySQL said that on our website as recently as 2001, I might add. And then they added foreign keys and they decided it was a good idea. But, <clears throat> so yes, there's a very shallow learning curve for that. Um, try to learn all of that. It's hard to say, but I, I really didn't want to go down that path of trying to get into a fight with other languages, trying to compete that way. I wanted to find a way of presenting Perl in a positive light. This was admittedly, at times, a very negative keynote. And I apologize for that, it was very somber, and I know many people probably weren't comfortable with some of the things I was talking about, but I needed to be honest about that and point out how we really have healed ourselves. And we've gotten ourselves into a really good, solid position to push ourselves forward. But I don't want to try and make this into some zero-sum game of pushing down the other languages because I love Python. I think it's a great language. I enjoy Ruby. Um, PHP is not to my taste, but that's just me. Um, so I just I wanted to avoid that as much as possible. I'm <laughs> so your question was hard? Uh, so yes, we could do a lot more with that. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of difficulty addressing the issue of presenting good beginner friendly documentation before Perl 6 is released because Perl 6 is coming along like gangbusters right now. So we can't get there yet. Uh, we, we should. But that, that's, that's another story that we can work on for a different time. Because I don't think we have the time to meet the next, uh, next turning point that we have. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure. Did you criticize Perlmonks? I can think about many reasons for to criticize Perlmonks, but I want to tell yours. I'm sorry, what was your question? Perlmonks. Perlmonks. Did you criticize it? Uh, I didn't criticize it per se. Uh, when I said party like this 1999, um, I was referring to the user interface. There's a lot of fantastic information on Pearl Monks. It's a fabulous resource. I still check it from time to time. Very helpful people there. However, appearance is part of communication. And when you have something which looks like it's 20 years old, then people are going to think, oh, this is 20 years old. And you know, I know particularly I've met resistance with this in many people in the Pearl community. Um, we don't feel comfortable with the idea of appearance being that big of a deal. But it is a huge deal to many people out there. Appearance is important. We do have to address it. Um, I don't know whether or not that will get addressed in Perlmonks. I don't know much about that side. I've heard some things, but they're only rumors. So I don't want to pass along rumors in that case. So Perlmonks is fantastic. I don't mean to criticize it in terms of content, but in terms of appearance, it's a disappointment to me. Yeah, I agree with you. I just wanted to know what you criticize. Thanks. No. More questions? We have, oh yeah, we have time. Jeff? You said that the 2013 Gartner report was extensive but covered a lot of programming languages. Um, what other lessons from other programming languages, sorry, programming languages, uh, might be buried within the Gartner report that, that we can use? Okay, so. The report itself was very fascinating. They, they call it the IT market clock for programming languages. And the idea is you have four quadrants on this clock. You have beginning languages, maturing languages, stable languages, and languages which are going obsolete. Uh, COBOL was kind of in that fourth quadrant, but it's not going anywhere because it can't. Uh, Java, C, C++, those were very much in the stable categories, unlikely to advance into the fourth obsolete category because they're stable, they're solid, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Perl potentially had a, a five to 10 year sunset in this case. This is not a guarantee. Again, this is predicting the future. This is predicting the future a lot further out. And when I say Perl, we're talking about Perl 5. They didn't address Perl 6 at all that I recall. And <clears throat> so Ruby was 
more immature than Perl, but definitely an up and coming language that many companies wouldn't want to consider. Python was more stable, as I recall. Uh, it's it's been, a, been a few weeks since I've read the report. I can't read all of it. Uh, and I also can't share it because uh, that would be a big no-no. But it's very fascinating reading and they do a great job of listing the languages, listing the strengths, their weaknesses, what's actually going on with them. So I was very impressed with what happened with the report. But there's a lot of languages which have gotten to a point of great stability, great maturity, and it's unlikely they're going to shift anywhere. There's an open question on the case of Perl, and a lot of that, I think, is due to the communication. Any other questions? Just a follow up about the Gartner report. Um, you, you said they did a lot of research. What sources did they cite or what research? Uh... I don't remember. At the end of the report, uh, they list, they don't describe their methodology in detail. So they're not just uh, a predict the future company. They're not just research. They also do a lot of consulting. They have a lot of larger corporate clients and they talked about uh, part of their research was you know, understanding trends online, pulling in data sources, you know, seeing what's happening on GitHub, for example, uh, finding out what their corporate clients are saying. So incidentally, a lot of their corporate clients they were pointing out weren't talking about moving away from Perl. They were interested in standards in Perl, in modernizing Perl. So that was another reassuring thing that was in the report that I actually should have put up, put up here, but there was just too much information. So evidently not enough when I added. So, <clears throat> They, a lot of this was you know, clients coming to them saying, this is what we would like to do with such and such a language, adopt the language, move away from the language. And sometimes Gardner admitted they were mystified, like uh, F-sharp, we think F-sharp should be doing you know, much better than it is, why isn't it? And they discussed reasons for that. Uh, but so a lot of it was their deep personal experience working in this area and a huge amount of research online, but they didn't always detail all their methodology as well as I would like, and there's some that I'm sure I'm not remembering at this point. Next question. Uh, I think it's just a small remark. If you have a new communication out there, uh, I think it's allowed to quote Gartner bits and pieces. So people are really um, interested in, in their language and uh, what it is, then they can uh, get the Gartner report by themselves. Yes, fair so use is great. Yeah. Um, the question is, you know, what, what areas would you be targeting? So the story of the trans woman being openly accepted by the Perl community at a conference, that's a human interest story where snippets from the Gartner Report are gonna be less compelling, but nonetheless does help to get the Perl community, the Perl name out there, and also information about the Perl community. Then if we're gonna find ways of tech, you know, targeting technical sources, then that's a perfect time to bring up that information. Anyone else? Oh. Um, so what we're bracing ourselves for is a, a round of new interest in Perl because of the release of Perl 6 um, and the A, and the slogan you've got behind your head says Perl 5 to me. Are we, do we have as a community a view on how we're positioning these two? If somebody comes to me and says, should I set up my new website in Perl 5 or, or Perl 6 or some other language, what do I say? And equally, if someone comes to me and says, I want to learn a language, which, which way should I point them? And do we have a, a sort of corporate view on that? Not just my opinion, no, your opinion. Okay, so uh, your question is, if someone comes to you and says, okay, Perl does look interesting, I wanna know about it, you know, should I be using Perl 5 or Perl 6? Is that the question? Yeah. So right now, when we're talking about Perl 6 being production ready, uh, this depends upon certain values of production ready, or you know, if it's released, depending upon how you wanna describe it. Perl 6 is, one developer has told me that they expect it to possibly be an order of magnitude slower than Perl 5 at first but huge, huge opportunities for advancement. So if you want something which is tremendously scalable, maybe Perl 6 is not your best option, and the module ecosystem is gonna be relatively immature. There's a lot of stuff we need to figure out. So this is one of the things where, just as you wouldn't want to adopt a JavaScript framework of the week for a mission critical system, if you have something that you wanna play around with that it's you know, kind of okay to fail, maybe you wanna adopt a new technology, Perl 6 would be a great choice for that because then you can learn a lot more about it um, it depends upon your level, your comfort level with the amount of risk that you have. Otherwise, Perl 5 is very mature, very stable. We know it's happening. It's got a rich ecosystem of modules. Run, and, you know, it's very powerful. And depending upon what you need, you know, you've got most of what you need on the CPAN already for the core of it. So does that answer your question? Yes. Sort of, yes. The best answer might be and, not or. 
No, OK. Hey, yes, Larry pointed out that the answer might be and instead of or. So it's not necessarily an either or. I guess I think what I'm, I'm getting to is perhaps one thing we need is a definite community statement that sort of says, says what you said, perhaps in fewer words, because people like shorter words, you know, in fewer <laughs> words. Um, and that that needs to be a live statement so people don't go along in two years' time and find a statement that says, Pulisic's, yeah, a bit slow, but interesting, and, and use Pol 5. It needs to change by the month as Pulisic gets more modules and becomes more and more a, a, a live language for Pol Science. I'm unsure how we would create a definite community statement on that. It's a very interesting idea. That would be the sort of thing like Battle Tested, where you're trying to get everyone together to you know, focus on a particular point. So Perl 6 could be fantastic for a lot of tools that you use on a day-to-day -day basis, say a lot of command line tools. It's very powerful. They're very simple. You know, maybe a community statement of, you know, this place is appropriate for Perl 5. This place is appropriate for Perl 6. You know, we're looking at ways of interoperability. I don't know. I don't know what would be appropriate there. And it would be hard for me to say at this point what would be a good community statement to cover both. I mean, for my statement, I love Perl 5. It's battle tested. It's great. I would switch to Perl 6 if I could, uh, but I can't, so I won't. Um, because it's a fantastic language, but that's just me. So I'd be hard pressed to really answer that and say which direction we would go on that. Can I make a show box? So it's Perl 5 battle tested, Perl 6 future tested. <laughs> I love you, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, if you didn't hear that, Perl 5 battle tested, Perl 6 future tested. That is really, really nice. <laughs> so if you happen to be in uh, OSCON in Amsterdam, I'm going to be redoing my you know, Perl 6 for mere mortals talk. I think I'll be stealing that line, amongst other things. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we got time for a couple more questions, if anyone has any. Um, just another remark. Some month ago, we had a discussion at the Frankfurt Perl Mongers about e-learning re resources to learn Perl. We we looked at there's a, a lot of uh, training material for Python and Ruby, and not a lot for Perl. So if we're talking about uh, a lot of bad programmers posting on uh, a Stack Overflow and asking stupid questions, it's also reflecting that there's not so much training material which is up to date because e-learning something uh, asking for a task um, offering a possibility to hack code into the browser and getting a feedback that it was uh, d delivers the the tested results the expected result is something which could be expanded just as, a, as an input in your list yeah, that's, that's hitting the same thing that I think Christina's talking about, you know, with, you know, PHP's got all this great documentation. That's not something I think we can address as quickly as we could before this next turning point that we have coming up when Perl 6 is released and we possibly have renewed interest that we have to deal with. Uh, the main thing is we need to find a way to differentiate, I think, between Perl 5 and Perl 6 and show where both are appropriate uh, and, you know, hopefully lay the ground for people to be interested in both because they're both awesome. Any other questions? I see a finger pointing. I see a finger pointing back. That's not helping. Yeah. Ah. Um, yes. Well, I have not a really question, but more of a remark with regards to the discussion about uh, documentation. Uh, people don't really tend to care about languages per se. We don't have uh, Ruby girls and uh, Python girls, but we have Django girls and we have Rails girls. And um, you know, it's the the frameworks take a lot of the 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 light these days. So if we're going to present ourselves as a language, I don't think that's going to be challenging because in Pro Five we have multiple good frameworks to present together. That's a lot of the module ecosystem is immature in Perl 6. Uh, you know, Dancer's been ported to Perl 6. I know there's quite a number of things out there. But yeah, that's, that's simply not going to be there yet. We have to wait for people to come along and see how great the language is so they can start building out those things. Uh, my, the, Did I misunderstand? If, if it, uh, no, I, I misrepresent my point, actually. Um, I think if we're taking 
if you look at it from the point of view for models, uh, modules, then you to take something that you add to the language. But if you t take a look at something like Rails or Django, then it's uh, a whole system which in, within which you work. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think one of the challenges is that, that these are the things, those whole uh, rapid application development systems are what people are most interested in today. We're is going to get those for Perl 6. They are going to come along. They are going to happen. Uh, I think part of the issue there is, you know, the Perl 6 language spec, you know, particularly the past few years, it evolved quickly enough, and they finally were coming to this convergence point of, okay, these are actually the features we needed. That, you know, some of the older, some of the old things, I have some old Perl 6 code which doesn't run anymore uh, because there were some clarifications to the language and it was harder to build bigger, more robust things while we're, we're still nailing down some of the final details. We're getting to the point where that's finally going to happen. I know I have some stuff on my slides, Perl 6 for Mere Mortals, which I have to re reevaluate in light of the great list refactor, which I believe is, it, the GLR is done now, yes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. That was one of the blockers for uh, Perl 6 finally being released. So. <clears throat> You can't build something that big while you're, you know, you can't build a huge house when you're still finishing up the foundation. And they are finally finishing up the foundation. That will come. It will not come yet. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. A follow up question uh, um, uh, to another question that a uh, uh, colleague asked. Uh, uh, few seconds ago regarding uh, the online resources. Um, I was never interested, uh, to tell the truth, um, in certifications of any type. So for, for me, it was, uh, um, I always concentrated on getting the knowledge and then uh, testing in practice if I can do the job that I think I can do. But if you look on the questions that are often posted on uh, LinkedIn groups or or a Stack Overflow, there are, there are repeat, repeated big questions about certification programs. And maybe I'm missing something, but I don't think that there is any worldwide certification program. And I'm just wondering, is, it the, is, it, is, there a, is this a point that we should consider to make uh, um, um, Perl more attractive for, for, for um, programmers that are starting to work with that? Is it, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last bit of the question? I missed part of that. Uh, should we consider some um, certifications, certification programs to make Perl more attractive for for people who, come, who are considering learning Perl, so that they can um, pass the certification and then feel that they have some knowledge and some paper that they could show to the employer? Like, do you think this this would make Perl more attractive to some people? Any question of certification of the Perl community is basically throwing a hand grenade into the conversation. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people have argued for it, a lot of people have argued against it. Uh, to me, it's, it's not something that I have a particular position about. You know, I, I fought both ways before. Now it's less interesting to me simply because certified in what? I mean, it's so big, it's so huge, we're talking about, you know, a lot of people know that I'm a very, very good Perl programmer. I can't do soccer programming without popping open the book and looking it up because I don't remember all of those things. Uh, does that mean I shouldn't be certified? Does that mean that I'm not as good as some other people who could do low level stuff? Someone's nodding that I shouldn't be, okay. <laughs> Whereas there's other people who could do a lot of that low level stuff, uh, but they probably couldn't do some of the stuff I do on a different scale. Um, should they not be certified? Certification is really a, a hot political, was a hot political topic, and it really opens up a can of worms. If you think you can figure out some way of pulling that off, more power to you. I, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole, no offense. So thank you very much, everyone. Before everyone runs away, remember we have about two hours to get two and a half kilometers away. The Google says it will take 32 minutes to walk unless you find another solution. Find some buddies and get going. Okay, okay guys, uh, before you leave, remember that uh, we will meet at the Los Angeles Hotel. I so in, case, in case you miss it, yeah. there are a, a bus stop in this street, uh, in this street, uh, and the... Uh,